The sea otter is broadly recognised as one of the cutest marine mammals, and it's not difficult to see why. Since the mid-1970s, the beauty and charisma of the species has gained wide attention. The sea otter's expressive face, soft furry body and adorable behaviour has made them a popular inclusion at zoos and aquariums. And yet, the species has faced immense pressures from humans over the last 250 years, with the sea otter nearing extinction at the start of the 20th century. Before we get into that mess, let's start with the species classification. The sea otter was first scientifically ranked in 1758 by Carl Linnaeus, as usual. The species went through several name changes before landing on Anhydra lutris, with Anhydra deriving from the ancient Greek word for in the water, and lutris being Latin for otter. As returning viewers will know, the first name denotes a species genus, while the second is unique to it. Unfortunately for the sea otter, the Anhydra genus is a pretty lonely one, because the other two members are extinct. To find its closest living relatives, we need to move further out to the subfamily Lutrinae, which contains all living and extinct otter species. Other than sea otters, Eurasian and river otters are the best recognised of this group. And finally, if we move all the way out to this species family, we get to Mustelidae. Here we can find badgers, weasels, domestic ferrets and the wolverine, among many others. The sea otter is distinct from this group though, as they're the only mustelids to not make dens or burrows. In fact, they're so different from their relatives that as recently as 1982, some scientists still believed it was more closely related to earless seals. Fossil evidence indicates that the Anhydra genus became isolated from other otters roughly 2 million years ago. Given that seals first entered the water about 20 million years ago, the sea otter is a relative newcomer to marine environments. But as usual, keep in mind that humans have only been around for 300,000 years, and written language is just 5,000 years old. So while 2 million years is beyond our comprehension, it's nothing to the Earth itself. Three sea otter subspecies are currently recognised, with distinct geographical distributions and slight physical differences between them. The Asian sea otter from Japan and Russia is the largest, has a slightly wider skull and shorter nasal bones. The northern sea otter, which ranges from Alaska's Aleutian Islands to Oregon, possesses a longer lower jaw, while southern sea otters from California have longer snouts and smaller teeth. Of the 13 living otter species, the sea otter is the second largest. Males are between 1.2 and 1.5 metres long, or 3 foot 11 to 4 foot 11 when measured from nose to tail. Females are only slightly smaller, measuring between 1 and 1.4 metres, or 3 foot 3 to 4 foot 7 in length. Only the utterly monstrous species known as the giant otter outdoes the sea otter in this field, with some males measuring 6 feet long. But even with its much smaller size, the sea otter is by far the heaviest member of the mustelid family. Females typically weigh in at 14 to 33 kilograms, or 31 to 73 pounds. Males are significantly heavier, at 22 to 45 kilograms, or 49 to 99 pounds. Despite this weight, the species is one of the smallest ocean-dwelling mammals, outclassing only the marine otter found along the west coast of South America. Most marine mammals have a thick layer of blubber beneath their skin, that help the species maintain body heat while also making them more buoyant and streamlined. Sea otters are a rare exception, being one of only a few species to lack this internal insulation. Instead, they rely on their exceptionally thick fur to keep warm. With 150,000 strands of hair per square centimetre, or nearly 1 million per square inch, the species' fur is the densest of any animal. Like many species, the sea otter's fur consists of two layers. The bottom layer is known as the down hair or undercoat, which helps maintain body temperature not unlike the blubber of other marine mammals. But while blubber warms the animal internally, this layer of fur creates an air pocket beneath it and the skin, where air is trapped and heated by the body. The top layer is known as the guard hair, which is longer and coarser to keep the dense undercoat dry. While sea otters may appear wet in these images, cold ocean water does not pass this top layer, which means their skin stays warm and heat loss is limited. Fur can be disadvantageous for marine species when it comes to diving, as the warm pockets of air held against the skin expel under pressure. The deeper the sea otter dives, the more the air is compressed, which eventually leads to loss of body temperature. This makes blubber more well suited for deeper ocean environments, as it doesn't compress at all. Sea otters lack a distinct molting season, retain their thick fur all year round. 
The hair is shed and replaced gradually, which requires the species to spend hours a day cleaning themselves to maintain their vital guard hairs. This isn't an issue for sea otters as they are incredibly flexible, being able to reach and groom the fur on any part of their bodies. This is thanks to their loose skin and unusually supple skeleton. This skeleton has a condition known as osteosclerosis, characterised by solid bone structure with little to no marrow. It's a disorder in humans, but for species like the sea otter, this increased bone density reduces buoyancy, allowing them to complete deeper dives than they would otherwise be able to. But given the amount of photos we've already seen with these guys back floating, surely they would want to be buoyant, right? Well, they actually already are due to their massive lung capacity, which is about two and a half times greater than that of similarly sized land mammals. This means that sea otters have great control over their buoyancy, purely based on how much air they're holding in their lungs. This animal skeleton is just one of many adaptations to their environment, as sea otters are the only otter species capable of living exclusively in the ocean. Other adaptations include its nostrils and ears, which the sea otter can close while it dives in order to keep them dry. Their tails are fairly short, thick, and muscular, which the species uses to maintain balance while swimming. And to better deal with their aquatic and often slippery prey, sea otters have short front paws with retractable claws and tough pads on the palms to help with grip. Their hind feet, which provide most of their propulsion while swimming, are long, flat, and fully webbed. The fifth digit on each hind foot is the longest, allowing the species to swim while on its back, but at the cost of making walking more difficult. Many semi-aquatic species evolve to preference one environment over another, and like in my video on the leopard seal, the sea otter largely favours the ocean and is a little awkward on land. This species has an extremely fast metabolic rate compared to similarly sized land mammals. It burns energy two to three times faster than them due to its cold water environment, which demands a lot of eating to compensate. Sea otters must eat an estimated 25 to 38% of their own body weight each day in order to burn the calories necessary to counteract the loss. This fast metabolism means that food is completely digested and passed in as little as three hours after consumption. Most of the species need for water is met through food, but in contrast to most other marine mammals, they also drink seawater. The animal's relatively large kidneys are able to derive fresh water from seawater like a sieve, excreting the salt and other unwanted elements in a highly concentrated urine. Depending on the availability of food in the area, sea otters may spend anywhere between 24 to 60% of their day foraging for food. They hunt in short dives, often to the sea floor. Although sea otters can hold their breath for up to 5 minutes, their dives typically last about 60 seconds, with longer trips capping out at around 4 minutes. Sea otters are the only marine mammal capable of lifting and turning over rocks, which they often do with their front paws when searching for prey. Under each front leg, the species has a loose pouch of skin that extends across the chest, which they use to store collected food. Once they've reached the surface, sea otters eat while floating on their backs, using their front paws to tear the food apart and bring it to their mouths. To keep themselves from floating out to sea when resting or eating, the species may wrap themselves in kelp. This pouch also holds a rock unique to the otter that is used to break open shellfish. The sea otter's use of rocks when hunting makes it one of the few mammal species capable of using tools. To open hard shells, the species may pound their prey with both paws against a rock on their chest. Some more challenging prey, like abalone, can cling to rock surfaces with a force equal to 4,000 times their own body weight. To pry them off, sea otters will hammer the abalone shell using their rock at a rate of 45 blows in just 15 seconds. They're not picky eaters either, as sea otters have over 100 prey species, including clams, mussels, crustaceans, and snails. In studies performed at Amchitka Island in the 1960s, 50% of food found in sea otter stomachs was fish. Bottom dwellers such as the Red Irish Lord and various species of pufferfish were the main prey to these northern populations. Sea otters are actually the only marine mammal to catch fish with their front paws, rather than their teeth. The species has a number of natural predators, such as sea lions and orcas, also known as killer whales. Bald eagles are a bit smaller to tackle adult sea otters, but will snatch pups from the surface of the water. In California, great white sharks appear to be the primary predator. While they spend a limited amount of time on land, sea otters may still be attacked by bears and coyotes. The species has an important ecological role as a keystone species. Animals with this status have a disproportionately large effect on their natural environment relative to their abundance. Many but not all keystone species are predators, but the sea otter is a classic example of one. 
Simply put, sea otters are to sea urchins what grey wolves are to deer, in that they both keep their prey's population in check. Left on their own, deer may graze in a local plant life until it's barren. Similarly, sea urchins will graze in the lower stems of kelp, causing it to drift away and die. The loss of habitat and nutrients provided by kelp forests leads to profound cascade effects on the marine ecosystem. North Pacific areas that lack sea otters often turn to what's known as urchin barrens, with abundant urchins and no kelp forest. This is super important to us as kelp forests absorb CO2 from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, meaning that sea otters protecting them from sea urchins is an incredibly important role. The Generation 5 starter Pokemon Oshawott and its evolutions Duot and Samurott are based on the sea otter, with the final form taking more after sea lions. Oshawott and Duot's designs also include shells on their bodies, referencing the sea otter's ability to use them as tools. The samurai theme present in these designs is fitting given that sea otters are found in select parts of Hokkaido, the northernmost prefecture of Japan. The species would later feature in the 2016 Pixar film Finding Dory. While they have no spoken dialogue, the sea otters are appropriately found in the fictional Marine Life Institute, largely based on the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California where the species is found. The sea otter can fare well in captivity, and is housed in over 40 public aquariums and zoos around the world. Thanks to their thick fur, sea otters have long been hunted by humans to use their pelts in our clothing. For many seafaring peoples across the North Pacific, the species played an important role as both a material and cultural resource. The sea otter's warm pelt was given in potlatches, a gift-giving feast practiced by indigenous peoples of America's Pacific Northwest coast. These pelts were reserved for major celebrations, such as coming-of-age ceremonies, weddings, and funerals. The pelt was also used as chief's regalia in many groups from coastal British Columbia, such as the Nulchar Nulth and the Haida. On the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska, sea otter bones were used in ornaments and games. The baculum, or penis bone, was powdered and used as medicine for fever by the Aleutian people. Throughout this region, most cultures have what's known as animus traditions, belief that objects, places, people, and animals all possess spirits. Among the Ainu from northern Japan and Russia's Far East, sea otters were given the important role as a messenger between humans and the creator, Kotan Ka Kamoi. The species is a recurring figure in Ainu folklore. One of the most, if not the most important piece of Ainu literature is Katane Shirika, which tells a tale of an epic war fought over a golden sea otter. The many human-like behaviours of sea otters, such as playfulness and tool use, has made the species well suited to anthropomorphism, or attribution of human characteristics onto non-human entities. Versions of a widespread Alawit legend tell the story of lovers or despairing women who plunge into the sea and become otters. Sea otters live in coastal waters between 15 and 23 metres deep, or 49 to 75 feet. While they can potentially survive in the ocean for their entire lives, the species usually stays within a kilometre or two thirds of a mile off the shore. This is partially to protect them from severe ocean winds, as rocky coastlines, thick kelp forests and barrier reefs can serve as a valuable windbreak. Sea otter distribution ranges from northern Japan and Russia's far east, through the Aleutian Islands to mainland Alaska and Canada. Smaller and more fragmented populations may be found on the west coast of the United States, all the way down to the Baja California and Mexico, although the species are predominantly congregated around California, Seattle and Vancouver. At their peak, the sea otter population is thought to have been between 150,000 and 300,000 individuals. That was until 1741, which marked the beginning of the maritime fur trade. Now this part of history definitely deserves its own video, so I won't go into all the details here, but in short, the innate value of sea otter pelts became commercialised and exploited during this time. Pioneered by the Russians, sea otters were hunted en masse from Kamchatka along the Aleutian Islands to the southern coast of Alaska. The British and Americans entered the trade in the 1780s, filling in the gaps by focusing on what is now the coast of British Columbia. Captain James Cook joined in to ruin everything, like usual, and rapidly sold the furs at a Chinese port for high prices. Sea otter pelts were considered to be extremely desirable as a fashion item in China, and they were one of the few imports the country was interested in during this time. The pelts were soon known as soft gold, in reference to their value and scarcity, which brought interest to an all-time high in 1884. But what's this massive 
Drop off. Well, over 50,000 sea otters were hunted by American and Russian ships between 1803 and 1846, the vast majority being done by the Americans. Due to the species' slow breeding, the sea otter population could not keep up with this intense demand, which quickly made commercial hunting unviable in many areas. The prohibitively high cost and extremely limited supply essentially killed the maritime fur trade. But after 60 years of aggressive hunting by multiple world powers, the damage had already been done. So few sea otters remained that many believed the species would become extinct. Estimates suggest that less than 2,000 individuals remained in the wild, a 99% decrease in global numbers. Prices rose as the species became rare. From the 1880s to the turn of the 20th century, furs would increase in value by a factor of 10. By 1903, a pelt could be worth as much as 200 pounds or 1,100 US dollars. A lot, right? In 1903 money. So if you account for inflation, these pelts would cost about 27,000 pounds, or just shy of 30,000 US dollars, for a bit of fur. But even by the stands of the early 1900s, people recognised that conservation action had to be taken. In 1911, Russia, Japan, the United States and Great Britain signed the Treaty for the Preservation and Protection of Fur Seals, imposing a prohibition on the harvesting of sea otters. The species population has rebounded in the time since, with the sea otter now occupying two-thirds of its normal range. The IUCN didn't yet exist during the maritime fur trade, but since being established in 1948, sea otters have been consistently listed as endangered. Hang on, why? Didn't we fix the problem? Yeah, hunting is no longer a major threat to the species, largely because we've learned our lesson on that one. The hunting of sea otters is no longer legal except for limited harvest by indigenous peoples in the United States. But while that issue isn't much of a factor, other threats have come to take its place. The most eye-catching and important concern when it comes to sea otters is oil spills. The species is particularly vulnerable to this since they rely on their fur to keep warm. Remember before when I said their undercoat always stays warm and dry? Well that isn't true when it's soaked with oil, because it's so much thicker than water. When this happens, the undercoat loses the ability to retain air, and this almost inevitably leads to the sea otter dying of hypothermia. To avoid this, the animal needs to groom itself, cleaning the oil from its body. But doing this leads the sea otter's liver, kidneys and lungs becoming damaged as they ingest the harmful chemicals into their system. Sea otters regularly come into conflict with fisheries where they can entangle themselves in fishing gear and drown. Their seafood diet has led to fisheries blaming the species on the decline of shellfish populations, which is complete crap. Sea otters naturally prey on these species as part of their ecosystem, while humans are an introduced threat. The decline of shellfish is more likely to be caused by overfishing, disease and pollution, all of which humans have a part in. But their impact on commerce means that shellfish harvesting advocates have opposed allowing the sea otters range to increase, with some choosing to poach them. In California, the parasite Toxoplasma gondii is widespread in the species, with one study revealing that 42% of live sea otters have antibodies to it. The parasite, which is often fatal to sea otters, is carried in the feces of wild and domestic cats. It's likely that this waste is being flushed down toilets and sinks by cat owners, before being carried out to the ocean through sewage systems. In some areas, sea otters are thriving, while in others the populations continue to diminish. It's a complex issue, but one that humans have a huge part in. While I've already mentioned them in this video, I'd like to point you towards the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California, who are the leading groups in sea otter conservation. The aquarium is perhaps best known on YouTube for their 24-hour live streams of their various enclosures, including the sea otter, but they do a lot to help the species outside of that. Their sea otter program does extensive work in rescuing stranded otters and putting them on the road to recovery, and that's just one of many animals they provide aid to. I'll leave a link to their website in the description below, so be sure to check them out and consider donating to help the species. Thank you for watching. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to sea otters, and fitting all of that into this script was a real challenge. Regardless, I hope this was interesting. My next video will be up in two weeks, but not on an animal this time. It's a uni assignment, but one I'm pretty happy with, so that can be a fun little surprise. Back to usual after that one though, see you then.